Hello and welcome to Investing with Beecham and Bright IG's weekly financial podcast. I'm Chris Beecham, Chief Market Analyst for the UK. And this week I'm joined by, in a wonderful piece of content cross-pollination, <laughs> uh, Rich McDonald from Trade Live with IG. So we thought this week it would be Beecham and Dim rather than Beecham and Bright. Very good, very good. No, it's not very fair. How are you, Rich? <laughs> very well indeed. Very well. Fresh from the show this morning. I know, you're still bright and lively after an early start. You know? Which is incredible. It was a 4 a.m. alarm this morning. But um, yeah, excited because this is something I've listened to, something Obviously, I've watched. you're an avid listener. That's right. And Aaron, of course, is away sunning himself in Buenos Aires. South America, yeah. Yeah. Interesting about enough. to go to Brazil. Um, so I couldn't be more jealous sitting here. Well, you, like, you get me instead. Well, yeah, who's, who's more jealous you, of, who's right more now? Less. Yeah, that's the key <laughs> thing, really, yes. Aaron's yeah. off for two weeks, so we shall be um, managing somehow in his absence. Um, but we thought this week we do a little bit of a, more of a story time. How interesting. Now we've got you as a guest. As I said, I felt this was more of a mastermind setup. That couldn't be more further from no, the truth. No, 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 no specialist subject, <laughs> no general knowledge around. Um, we thought we'd talk about how you got into investing, because I think the, the theme of the podcast is really it's sort of investing the basics, how people learn, how they get into it. And clearly you are consumed by the financial markets. That's a know. great way to put and, it. And yeah. how did it happen, really? Ooh, how long do we have? Well, we'd have about probably at most an hour, but I may mean to go for less. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good to know. So it started when I was 12. 12? At 12 years old, I was working for my father who had his own accountancy business. And I used to get the bus down after school and I would have to deliver his letters, uh, go to put his checks in for the bank. Mm. Um, and then would sometimes go into uh, John Menzies and, and play the video games, unknown to, to him that he was paying me for doing such things. And I was on the, the grand sum of two pounds an hour and that would be for one hour a day. So my, my wages for the week were 10 pounds. However, on a Friday, I'd have to go in and he would present me with the Financial Times. And he had a portfolio of eight stocks, of which I remember Allied Domec was one, um, Scottish Hydroelectric was another. <laughs> and, uh, you know, these are in the days when you got the actual certificates, of course. Yes. And I'd have to write down what the Financial Times said the current share price was. Right. And then I'd have to do the total and c compare the total with last week's figure. And if it was higher, if it had gone up in the week, then I would be, be, be paid double the wage for that week. So I'd 20 pounds. Now, 20 pounds at 12 years old. That's a lot of money. It is indeed. Um, especially back in the you know, early 90s yeah. as we're, we're talking. So that just got me fascinated with what these things were that I was valuing every week. And so by the, by the age of 16, when you go into the career counselor at school, I mm. knew exactly what I wanted to do because I'd heard of this job called a market maker. And that was it. She, she tried to talk me around because she didn't <laughs> actually know what a market maker was. So I think that might be why she was oh, trying to so talk it's me. That's not fair, you see. It's outside of a... The remit. Competence. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I was, I was certain. So now at the same time I was doing athletics and I was a 400 meter hurdler for a, a, a club called Shaftesbury Barnet, which is in North London. Mm. The head of Shaftesbury Barnet was very good friends with a gentleman who worked at Credit Suisse in the research. And he was the number one retail and consumer analyst for um, UK stocks. Mm. So I used to badger him when I was 18, 19, 20 year old and used to beg him for work experience. And eventually in August 2001, so when I was 21, then he gave in and he phoned me one Saturday evening. I was at my friend's barbecue in Haywards Heath and I remember the exact phone call. And he said, right, you're gonna come in for six weeks work experience. And that was it. And I started September the 10th, 2001. Sure. So it was a tricky second day. Wow. What was that like? It was um, all the nerves. So day one, I went in and uh, the, the assistant said, oh, get there for 9 a.m. Hmm. So I go, I won't go in for 9 a.m. So I thought I should be in at 9 a.m. every day. Hmm. So after about three weeks, she said, look, 
you know, getting slightly earlier. That was day one. Yeah. Um, but day one, uh, it was uh, the guy's name's Tony Schritt. So Tony Schritt became, you know, this, this top research analyst and, and was at this time. But he took me to see the Marks and Spencer's CFO on day one. Right. So I was sitting there myself, Tony, the CFO, and must have been investor relations looking back at it now. And we sat and chatted about the whole strategy of Marks and Spencer's in 2001. Mm. And I think it's still the same questions as they would try yeah. and argue yeah, today. Yeah, now, yeah. Um, but it was just fascinating because I wanted to give my opinion on Marks and Spencer from, um, you know, a 21 year old of why I might not shop there, why I would, why my granny shopped there. But I knew, you know, read the room. Yeah. My first day of work experience. Keep I your mouth shut, sit in the quiet. corner, learn. And I said to Tony on the tube back to Canary Wharf, I said, I was dying to, you know, to give my uh, opinion on mm. things. But he said, no, Rich, I think, I think you were wise not yes. to. So, uh, but even from that, you know, I was, I was passionate about companies. I was passionate about business strategy. Mm. And the fact you could connect those things with making money from investing in the company just had me completely consumed. Cool. So what was the first share you bought properly? I was gifted it for my 16th birthday um, because, of course, you couldn't trade yourself until yes. you were 18. So Scottish Hydroelectric, I received 100 shares, which was worth £600. Um, and I got the share certificate with my full name on it, mm -hmm. um, with my dad's name as a um, nominee. Yeah. And I'm going to look this up now as you talk. Yeah, Scottish Hydroelectric, so, which is, of course, uh, now Scottish Southern Energy. And uh, yeah, that was on my 16th birthday. But the one I actually bought for myself for the first time was Electronics Boutique on the 11th of January, uh, 1998. And I purchased that for 49 pence and subsequently sold it for 60 pence about two months later. That's not bad. So yeah, I was very... Electronics Boutique now, of course, is, is game. The, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, that was it. I spent my whole day's university. Um, I even got into options trading. I had no idea what I was doing. Uh, but the must have been second year of university. I was trading Royal Sun Alliance options. Um, yeah. And kind of just worked out that roughly a 50 delta meant that it moved as half as much as a share price yeah. did. Uh, How did yeah. you check your share prices then? Because this was before app become That's widely. Right. But I mean, I, well, we had this before in the previous podcast on about CFAC. And I that remember was watching my dad checking the share prices and they'd come around page one of the foot's and then page two. And if you wanted the first, you had to wait for it to come around again. That was it. So that's how it was done. And so, so, well, I think you had four pages. It was 201, 202, 203, <laughs> 204. Okay. And it was alphabetical. Um, but you're exactly right. If you, if you missed it, you had to wait, had to for, wait it to for it to come, come around. And God, I remember like Black Soul, um, the, the big ones at the time. It was all, you know, those days there was some mining stocks and my, my father had Rustenburg, Rustenburg Platinum or something like that. So he had a mining stock Fantastic. as well. What a great name. But this was, of course, when I, this was 1999. Yeah. So it was the dot-com boom. So I got into a stock called Minor Planet Systems, and it was genius. It was uh, GPS in cars okay. and vans and trucks. Yeah. And I had I'd read about it in the Investor's Chronicle, which of course meant that I was definitely first to the idea. Yeah. <laughs> the fact that... I used to read the Investor's Chronicle. Still about, you know. It is still, yeah, to be fair to them, it is still going, yeah, but I remember... 6.99? Is it? I think so, yeah. Um, but yeah, just the, you know, the share tips in there. But there was also, and this is perhaps why it led me into being on the, this TV show world, was there was a great show on BBC Two in 1999 because they, they realized that this dot-com boom was mm. just gold dust for, for viewing. And somebody would come on each week and they would tip a share. What was that called? Did, oh. did it show me the money? Is that, is that what it was? Was it show me the money? It I could well have BBC been. BBC Two. Yeah. Yeah. And Adrian... Adrian um, done something, mm. um, 
and he was he then went on to football presenting right but he was uh yeah the the presenter there but invariably the stock would be up seven percent yeah because the city people would be sitting watching they could lift the stock straight straight away in the screen uh so you know i invariably lost money on that but it was it was just great to watch and it was great to sit and listen to a tv program that was all about this thing that i love so much yeah so over the years maybe what's what are the lessons you've learned the ups and downs what are the great things you've learned about investing in markets and how they work because clearly you're still doing it and we're always That's learning right. with this kind of circular process isn't it, the best you always have to relearn the same things over and over again oh yeah you yeah you try and learn from the mistakes yeah um but i think it's a case of uh, I, I interviewed Martin Price last week, the, the head of investor relations here at IG. And he talked about the nirvana of a stock is one that's upgrading uh, at the start of an upgrade cycle. Mm. And it continually upgrades every six months, which means that it starts on a low PE and it gets revalued for not just the earnings, but also for the, the, value, the PE ratio as well. Yeah, And that is so simple, but so easy to forget. Because invariably, when a stock profit warns and it goes down, then you can't help but think the share price is getting cheaper and cheaper. It's cheaper and cheaper. It's, yeah. it's just not, is it? Well, no, it is. I suppose <laughs> in terms of if you're sort of value investing, you want stuff that's cheap, but then a lot of things are cheap for reasons. If it gets cheaper. I've, I've sat in presentations of fund managers and like Colour Wall, I think. Oh you know, goodness! I said we like the stock, and he put a picture of the chart up on the wall. As his company, and you could see it just going down. I think well, at what point do you stop? Two thousand sixteen. Yeah, what point do you stop liking it? Because it's clearly getting cheaper and cheaper, but for a reason. I mean, we got killed on that. I remember that. In fact, I think a guy got sacked on the back of that because we had twenty million dollars of tallow oil. Yeah, and it went down fifteen percent in a day. I remember. Yeah. So that was worse and worse. But this is the yeah. with investing, we always think and with trading as well, really. People have this urge to overcomplicate, don't they? Absolutely. Because understandably the way human minds work, learn something, you want to learn more, you want to learn more and apply it. And you end up, whether it's charting and you end up with so many lines on chart you can't see what it's doing, or you're looking for so many fundamentals mm. that it just makes it almost too complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Get getting something in that earnings upgrade cycle and research analyst upgrades price targets mm. um you know it's it's just when it's got pricing power then and it's you know relatively it's got a moat around it so it, it's yeah i was gonna say it's like warren buffett's idea of the moat that defensive yeah. thing that means it's and the idea is it's just sort of protected from its competitors That's I think right. it's like it's past its moat now we considered um, we were, uh, Brad and I were speaking at the weekend and we think that we could have a character Baby Buffett what do you think? we'll get you with a moustache and a pair of glasses and you'll be Baby Buffett <laughs> not that much not that much, <laughs> much of a baby about it really so. <laughs> well relative to Warren I think you are well yeah exactly what, he's nine, <laughs> is he 90 now? 96 96 yeah well I'd say no sometimes I get mixed up with Attenborough and Buffett He's nine, <laughs> nine, between 94 and 96. You don't see Buffett on many nature programs, do you? or indeed David Attenborough talking about markets. But... It'd be, maybe we could see them do a switch. Yeah, yeah, which will be seen as a transition. <laughs> what's your favourite, what's your best performing stock? What's your best story as an investor? Have you got well, that's one? a great question. It's more the, the shockers. I think the, the horrible ones are far more interesting than me sitting here blowing my own trumpet about the, well, go on then. The give, us an, give us an awful one. Though. Oh, well, Volmageddon was the worst one. So a reminder, like 2018, uh, it was the end of January, and Credit Suisse did this horrible product called XIV. Yeah. So inverse Everyone volatility. Yeah. So you are long XIV, which means that you benefit from vol going down. Hmm. Which seemed like <clears> such a sure thing, because we'd gone through... The end of 16 with the election and then 2017 had been an absolute snooze fest. I remember it. Nothing, it just went up all year, didn't it? The market was every day was up a little bit more, a little bit more. 20 basis points, 30 yeah. basis points every day. Yeah. 
and I, so I was quite short. So, um, I was also, I owned puts and I kept on losing premium, losing premium, losing premium. And it, they were just decaying. So I thought, right, to hedge that, then I'll go short some of this volatility. Mm. Of course, didn't do proper research on the product, didn't realize or didn't think about the fact, as many other people didn't, that volatility could be up 100% in a day, Yeah, which meant that this thing is worth zero. So I think I probably, by that point, it, was, it felt like such easy money. Because it's a very dangerous phrase. It was, yeah, it was the free lunch rubbish. <laughs> um, because you, you would invariably make enough on this every single day to cover your uh, theta, to cover your premium decay, and to cover your uh, being short the market. And um, yeah, it went from, I think I had 40,000 pounds in there, and it went to zero in a space of eight, eight hours. Eight hours. And I was in Medellin, Colombia, and um, you know, was just having a fantastic time over there. Yeah. I'd been to a football match the day before, and you know, it was coming to the end. We had spent a whole month there. I was part of a group called Remote Year. It was called. Uh, yeah, so re- so I I saw the twelve months, right, and twelve different countries traveling with a group of fifty of us, and so I was full time IG um, professional trader, I guess you would call it. And that's how I was financing my year abroad was through trading. And it was all going so well Mm. until this was month eight in Colombia. And I got to the end of the month and then that was wham, bam. (laughs) That was the end of that. Uh, Now you've had the, you were fortunate enough to have a background in sort of money, finance, that kind of thing. So you sort of had a familiar with markets from being very young. Yes. And I having had a dad that invested, so I knew how markets roughly works and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. If you are someone who has none of that, say you're what, 25, you think, well, I've started to make money. I need to put it somewhere. Mm. I can get 5% or whatever in a bank account, but I clearly want a bit more. And yeah. you see some of these crazy moves that go on in markets at the moment. What would you, not, what would your suggestion be if you're just starting out? So there's this wonderful show in the morning, 7.30 till 10 a.m. every day, Trade Live with IG on yes. YouTube. Yes, we know. It's very uh, <laughs> But I think, so it's very much the tortoise and the hare. Because unfortunately, and this is what I hate about crypto, is that it gave people this idea that you could double your money yeah. and triple your money within a short period of time. And that's just not the way that finance works. It's your, you know, if you're, have a really good year, it's up 15%. Yeah. If you have an incredible year, you're up 25%, right? And it's compounding those it's compounding, returns, yeah. um, which is just, you know, such an enjoyable process of uh, locking in those returns and doing it in a, a risk-adjusted, safe way. But what about if none of that makes, if you've just heard yeah. that, none of that makes any sense, and you're thinking, I've got to say, end of year bonus or whatever it is where do you where would you where would you sort of suggest people start out that's allocations of where they go etfs or is it i would you wouldn't probably start out with individual shares would you if you don't know anything about stocks that's it and so so many of my friends are in this position chris you know i i've got a really good friend who was um head of marketing at chanel fragrances for 10 years and then uh, she moved to burberry and now she works for an auctioneers and st- having all that expertise still knows nothing about the stock market, mm. right? So we have these conversations. I'm, I say, look, I don't want to give you advice because I'm only right six out of 10 times. So there's a chance I, I give you an idea mm. and it's completely wrong. And suddenly you think I'm crazy because I'm the expert in this industry and I don't know what I'm talking about, you know? So it's a case of, I, since 2020, I've been trying to teach people and I've been trying to teach people the basics of valuation because of course the number one risk is that they just jump onto the bandwagon of everybody else. Yeah. Tesla, NVIDIA, S&P 500, NASDAQ, uh, you know, all these names that all your friends tell you about in the pub. Yeah. Or you read about them in the news. 
and you read about the news. news. By the time yeah. you see something in the news, at least the first bit of the movie's already happened. I think that's always the way, isn't it? By the time you see the headline, such and such record high, because your mind only goes one way, doesn't it? Well, that's the way it used to happen. But now it's just continuous, isn't it? Mm. It's, it seems to be now you've heard the parable of the ox. No. No. So the parable Maybe. of the ox. So it is this wonderful story about how there was a village fair and the, the number one competition at the village fair was to guess the weight of the ox. Right. Now, they did it for the first four years. And it was really interesting. It was, um, you know, some people were close, some people were uh, spot on, but the average of the guesses was incredibly close to the actual weight of the ox. So I guess the wisdom of crowds. Yeah. Now, going into year five, the weighing scales broke. So they didn't have a way of weighing the ox anymore. Right. So... It was going to be very expensive to, to fix these weighing scales. So they decided just to take the average of the guesses, right? Mm -hmm. So in year five, it worked perfect. And they were you know, very happy. Everybody was very happy with the result. In year six, people heard what happened in year five. So they started to skew their guesses, right? And they started to get some people to make them really high or really low so they had a better chance of winning. So then the... Um, the, the farmers thought, well, you know, that, that's completely unfair. We're going to have to bring in a regulator. So they brought in a regulator. But they also found out the farmers had been selling information and, you know, research reports on what the, the ox had been eating, um, how much exercise it had. And so some people had a benefit over others mm -hmm. as well. So then they decided to put up a rule that if there was any news about the ox once a month, then the farmer had to stand up and deliver that news in a public forum. And uh, then, you know, there was all these various measures that they, they went through. And there was, you know, there was lots. The, the more important thing now was to guess the guesses of people, not the actual weight of the ox. The weight of the ox didn't matter anymore. No. It wasn't the answer anyway. So it was what all the... Um, you know, the various, yeah. so they, so obviously they built an algorithm because the algorithm would be able to work it out much better. Then they started to use AI to find out the answers. And somebody said in the end, they said, probably would have been just been cheaper to fix the scales, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and that's what's going on in the market just now. The mark valuation doesn't matter anymore. And well, it doesn't seem to matter. So the thing this week about the CAPE ratio, the, the cyclically adjusted P ratio, is now at its uh -huh. second highest ever, isn't it? It's, and it's not as high as 2000. Well, that's what I was, I was going to say, is, is 2000. So it can go higher, for yeah. example, but it is the second highest. And it's the thing of, it doesn't matter until it does. And that's, and that's what I feel that we're moving towards. I was very relieved to see Scott Percent. Uh, hired as Treasury Secretary, because out of all the appointments that Trump has made, it's the one that just gives me that little bit of reassurance that we're not going to do anything completely crazy. Yeah, but we're still sitting on levels of crazy in in the market, and not in the FTSE, not in the DAX, not in the CAC, because you know um, chocolate teapot springs to mind. Yeah, but you know we're in America in the Nasdaq where. And getting back to your original point, where would I suggest people look at or what do they learn? For years now, it has actually worked to just put um, this, you know, your good money after good. Yeah. The things that have gone up, the things that with momentum, the best stories in the market. But I just fear that people are about to get really hurt by doing that. There's a certain sense that it's all a bit too optimistic. And that's the, you have to remember this about markets that they will go up and up and up, and then there will be this not necessarily a crash. We're not talking 1929. You, know, you see this thing on on X on Twitter where people overlay the 1929 chart with now and say if it right. went down like that today, the Dow would go down to five thousand or something, which is clearly terrifying. But it's unlikely yeah. to happen in quite the same way because we live in a very different world. But there's always that sense of 
where would you, if you were starting out today, if today was day zero in your journey as investing, you've missed, under broader reason, you've missed out on, say, where are we now? 15 years since the crisis, mm -hmm. financial crisis of huge gain. How do you sort of... And free money. And free money. Well, it, free money in a sense, I suppose, if you, if that's what you want to call it. It's a slightly pejorative term, I think. Oh, sorry, not free money in uh, gains on stocks. I mean, free money as in the, the central bankers. Yeah. 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 But it's, it's kind of understanding things like diversification and making sure you don't put all your eggs in one basket. All these cliches that do have a grain of truth to them. Absolutely. And, and I think going into 2025, more than ever, it's important to get that di diversification right mm. and, you know, work out your correlations and work out the true valuation of things um, if we go into a slowdown. And not, not as analysts are projecting at the moment, because we know that analysts are always wrong. They got it too wrong 12 months ago. They thought we were going down yeah, and we've only gone up. And now they're all saying that we go up next year. Yeah. So, you know, that's you just have to be wary, don't you, when the crowd says one thing and, and does another, really, or when everyone thinks it's the same thing. I always think of it the analogy of if you have everybody standing on one side of the boat. Yes. And then they all run to the other side. That's kind of what markets do, don't they? They go from extreme optimism and they go to all, all the way to extreme pessimism within a very short space of time. If you look at 2022, we went from the world is ending there'll be a massive recession to suddenly couldn't move, you just buy anything that wasn't nailed down. And I remember the day I was back in Colombia, back in the same city as my Volmageddon, and that CPI number came out. And I was actually long a call spread, a call ratio. And I was, it was up 3% to up 5% on mm. the S&P. And as soon as the number came out, I thought, oh, fantastic, I've nailed this. S&P was up 3% in the straight line. Then it was up 5 and then it was up 6 and then it was up 7 And I ended up losing money, owning a call spread yeah. on the day the S&P was up 7 The day right. it turned around and didn't look back. And that was it. And outside my hotel was a, uh, a bull. And the market was at the lows of, you know, what, 9, 10-month low, yeah. having dropped, I think, 22% on the NASDAQ. And there was a bull literally sitting outside, staring me in the face every time I walked out of the hotel and I didn't take the hint. <laughs> <laughs> you should have done. And actually in 2009, this was one of the most crazy experiences. So I was at a, a well-known hedge fund um, in 2009 and February, I think it was February the 5th, myself um, and my boss, Jeremy went for lunch and there was a Royal China across the road and we were sitting having lunch and um, there was a, a beautiful woman walked out of the restaurant to go and have a cigarette. So my boss jumped up and he followed out and he you know, had a cigarette as well. And he came back in and he, he got her business card and she worked for a French company called justbuyit.com. And Jeremy was the biggest bear at that time because, of course, the S&P was at 670. Yeah. 670. <laughs> oh, my Three goodness. Three-figure S&P. Three figure S and P, and we were at. It looked like the world was going to end. And she handed him a card, justbuyit.com. What more do you need? Yeah, as a sign. As a sign. Yeah, and he didn't listen to her, and he invariably lost. I think two or three million over the next three months. This is how investors sort of they always fall into this trap that when the time comes to buy, you won't want to because there's that fear of I'd want to buy it now because it might keep going down, That's and then. It. The problem is, as well, you look back and you see what you should have done. And that's, it was, it's obvious now. Mm -hmm. It's obvious you should have bought it in March 2009. It's okay. obvious you should have bought the COVID lows. It's obvious you should have bought the end of 2022 because everyone was so bearish. But it's so hard at the time to sort of do what you think is clearly wrong. Or at least, I think this is the point about you don't have to go all in on any one trade, do you? You don't have to throw all your money in investing. Into, in one go, you can slowly drip it in over the course of months and you can build it up. Absolutely. And it's, it's learning those, uh, I call them price trigger strategies of buying as we go down or the uh, dollar cost averaging. Yeah. Um, or buying things on normal valuations or defensive stocks mm. or, you know, there's, there's so many variables there. Or um, 
you know, a retail outlet that you really like that is, you know, very popular and it's not about to go out of fashion. Yeah. I mean, people talk about NVIDIA, Marks and Spencers and Rolls Royce yeah. have probably performed about as well as NVIDIA in the yeah. past 18 months. And Domino's Pizza has listed the same, did it list the same day as Google or was around the same time? And Google was up something like, sorry, Alphabet now. Yeah, it's up sure, around yeah. sort of three thousand eight hundred percent, and Domino's Pizza is up five thousand percent. Really? So you don't have to necessarily be in the obvious names to get decent returns. That's right. There's, there's a whole. It's a market of stock. Not a stock market is another like, cliche. Has it? But but you know, from a very good place because it's, yeah. it's so true. You can you can. There's there's a big world out there. It's not all about the heavyweight. Now you're not getting away without telling us how you started investing. Oh well. It was, it's similar in a way, but as I say, I remember watching my dad check his stocks, or FTSE stocks as it was then. Of course. Know, I think he's still he's mostly FTSE investors. And looking at those, thinking, well, what are these strange things? Why did they go up? Why did they go down? It was mm -hmm. the first one I had was a biopharma company called Protherix. Wow. Um, which I don't know why we ended up with Protherix, but he's <laughs> like, he likes a bit of small cap. Um, still is, but I have to dissuade him from investing in AIM stocks at the moment. But um, I think, which I think is a great part of advice of even diversification, everything like that. Not listening to friends, good stock tips. No, this is not a horse race. No, exactly. It's yeah. a very, very bad idea most of the time. If someone says, yeah. "Oh, I've got a great story," oil right. exploration or yeah. gold exploration. Precisely, it's so it was Prosterix, and I think I held it for about three or four years. And I think I forget now why I held it, but mm -hmm. it did okay. I think it was taken over. Ah, good. So that was my first stock. And then a few others. I think we were talking about the last week, Aaron and I were talking about, I've had Next. That was a good one of mine that's done really, really well. Oh, incredible. So, and I just love, the, as a story, it does so well and it's weathered so many storms. Mm -hmm. it, it's not clearly delivered NVIDIA-like returns, but it's done all right. But, but it's been around for 20 years because yeah. I, I was the market maker for Next in 2004. And um, when I remember Marks and Spencers, so my, my boss and I were sitting, um, Chris Driscoll and I were sitting, and he was the market maker for Marks and Spencers. And um, actually, next was the very first stock I ever traded uh, on the book. I remember that. But um, our research analyst, Tony Shrett, the one who got me in, mm. uh, stood up on, on the, the trading floor in front of 400 people and said, all right, I've just had a conversation with the um, the guys from the IR from Marks and Spencers. He it is not going to be bid for. There is no bid, and boom, it hit the Bloomberg screen. Um, Philip Green to bid four pounds a share for Marks and Spencers. Brilliant. So Drisky popped up, and instantly, Marks and Spencers in a million, three pounds eighty to three pounds eighty five, eighty to eighty five. Who's who's gonna buy? Who's gonna buy? And I've never seen anything like it on a trading floor. We were the number one market share in Marks and Spencers that day. And we, he was just, he was trading like every 10 seconds, he was buying a million, selling a half, remaking the price, 85 to 90, buy a million. And I was having to make sure that I could keep track of what our actually book was. Yeah. And it, it took me forward. So that was 2004. And I had dinner with R Richard Caring about 10 years later. And he told me the actual story from the other side of things in that Philip Green and Richard Caron thought that they had it secured. Yeah. And then at the very last minute on the Sunday, um, the Marks and Spencer's board managed to turn it around and, and keep it with mm. appointing Stuart Rose. Yeah. So Richard Caring and Philip Green had resigned from Topshop on the Friday, ready to walk into Marks and Spencer's down Oxford Street yeah. on, on, the, the on the Monday. Suddenly they didn't have a job to go to. So that's why Richard Caring bought Caprice Holdings and the Ivy and Annabelle's and all those restaurants because he was bored. He had nothing to nothing do. To do, so he did something else instead. And a load of funding, yeah. Wow. So, and I think he just sold the Ivy Group for an incredible profit. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. As a fun lunch, I had no idea who he was. We met, we shook hands, and I said, Richard, introducing myself, mm -hmm. and he said, yes. <laughs> and I thought, well, that was rude. He didn't tell me who he was. And we sat down and we, we chatted. Um, basically, his girlfriend was the friend of 
my the girl I was seeing at the time, and we all went to Chilton Firehouse. There was four girls and me and Richard Kearing. And it took me 20 minutes to ask him what he did. Yeah. And he laughed. And he said, I guess you could say I'm an entrepreneur. <laughs> I said, oh, really? Well, what, what type of business? Yeah. And so, of course, his girlfriend was then, she was involved in the conversation. She was laughing. He said, have you heard of Topshop? I said, yeah. But in my head, I thought, well, you're not Philip Green. I know no. you're not Philip so Green. Are, yeah. Yeah. It was, oh, I own that. Oh, right. Okay. Have you heard of Annabelle's? Yes. I own that. And then he listed another three things. I was like, okay, I get the picture. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, but he didn't know that I knew Tony Charette. Yeah. And had been involved in Marks and Spencer's. So then we, we had a fantastic conversation for the next hour and then shared a couple of whiskeys through in the, the bar of Chilton Firehouse. Wow. So one last question. If you were starting out now in investing, what would, what would you tell, what would you, what's the one thing you'd give advice, say, flip it around, the one piece of advice you'd give to someone starting out, let's do it that way. So, okay, well, the process I'd go through is I would um, download IG Invest and then I would watch Trade Live with IG 7.30 to 10 a.m. every uh, week. cut this bit out, you know. And then, um, and then I would take the time to learn what I'm actually buying, right? What? does it mean to buy a stock? Mm. What are dividends? What is this, the earning stream? What am I actually, like getting to own a piece of a company is amazing. Yeah. Um, I remember when we, I first had a, a gin and tonic with Fever Tree in it. And I didn't even know Fever Tree no. was listed on the stock market. And my friend explained to me, look at, just taste the difference. And to being able to go and I didn't have the idea myself, mm. but as soon as I heard it, I thought that's genius. Yeah. And then I find out I could invest in it. And it's, I can be part of this story of a great company that somebody else has thought of, and I can grow my capital and earn income from um, buying into a, a yeah. share in it. So think about it that way, not, um, oh, NVIDIA is making so many people so rich. You know, I want or, a piece of that. Yeah. I want a piece of that. Think about the actual company and what you're, you're putting your money Very into. Sensible. You should understand what it does. It's Buffett's point, isn't it? I only invest in stuff if I understand what it does, which is why he didn't touch a thing in the dot-com bubble because he said, I don't understand them. I don't understand the valuations. I'm going to just leave yeah. them over there. And now we know and that now, he's got the most, amount, oh, most percentage of his fund in cash that he's ever had. Exactly. And if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is so often the way in investing. Rich, thank you. That was great. Thank you, sir. We should great finish off fire. with our on the day, on this day feature, because I know Aaron's not here, but I should do it even so. Um, you should have come up with some, really, but it's... Ah, there you are. What date are we on? Uh, mm. Second of December. We're into December, barreling scarily towards Christmas. Absolutely. Um, Which we have many exciting things set up in the Yes, in the what we're going to do. Our, I mean, I've got a few look ahead and stuff and our sort of predictions for the year ahead. It's always that time of year, isn't it? But analysts... It's the end of December, so therefore you have to predict what's going to happen in the next year. So everyone digs into their crystal ball and says, you know, the numbers for the S and P come out. What is it? So like six thousand six hundred a prediction for next year. It's pretty much the average that's Which come the out average. in the last I couple say, of weeks. They, you, they all aggregate together, and then you get that nine percent return. Go, well, that's not very exciting. Yeah. Until Albert Edwards comes out with his oh, yeah. 4,000 or Damn, something. He's still banging on about being a bear. Yeah, but second <laughs> of December in big day in French history, actually. So producer Fred will like this. Um, it's the and interesting enough it's the uh, anniversary of Napoleon being crowned emperor of the French of course it was and then for Napoleon fans which I'm sort of one is his famous victory at Auslitz which is where he defeats a combined Austrian Russian army in, in the snow and it's he's outnumbered and they think they're going to crush him and he just surprises them and it's a huge win wonderful so, big, and it's big a, day taken, there was a there was a certain strategy he, he had of the the ships, wasn't there? The, the Napoleon seven ship strategy. Was that a, a thing? Or is, is it, it the, the way that he would position his ships in some kind of formation? You know he was a general, not an admiral, though. Ah. You think you have Nelson? Ah, sorry, no, of course, I've ah, Nelson. You can't yeah, the yeah. two. That, see, that's the that's worst thing you can do. Disgraceful. No, okay. And then also, interesting enough, in Cuban history, 1956, the grandma 
which is one carrying Fidel Castro as they land in Cuba. And there's about sort of 80 of them, and they start the Cuban Revolution. So that's today in 50s. But there is a finance one. We should get a finance one in because 2001, what happened this day in 2001? On the 2nd of December. Well, I, so I was at, that's the only US Thanksgiving I've had. We did the turkey trot, which was my 5K. So it's the first time I ran a sub 20 minute five kilometers. Is enough, that this isn't in, in Wikipedia. <laughs> I've looked hard, but no, you're, you're close with turkey. Turkey's voting for Christmas. No. This is Erdogan. The quiz. Erdogan came in as no, no. no it's a, it's a financial thing. Okay. Biggest phone, um, financial scandal in history at that time. Corporate scandal. Enron. Enron filed for bankruptcy on this day in two thousand and one. Was that really? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Twenty three years ago. So wow. So I was I was, yeah, I was there for Enron and also. It was the first time that Ross and Rachel kissed in Friends. There you go. Hey, you always to bring the podcast back down to a more, more normal level. Thank you, Richard. That was brilliant. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Good to Pleasure be here. Have you on? Thank you, everyone. I will see you again next week. 